So Friday night in our house is movie night. We make pizza and gather in the family room, all six of us, for a movie. And this past Friday night, we watched Bruce Almighty. Does anyone remember that one from early 2000s? It didn't get great reviews. It has like a 48% on Rotten Tomatoes, but I think it's a pretty funny movie that actually can lead to some good conversations about the nature of God and faith. Um, so we watched the movie, and I was paying attention through the movie to what made the kids laugh because I was writing a sermon on laughter, and so I was considering these questions of what makes something and why do we laugh, and what's the point of laughter in our lives? And because the movie deals specifically with the relationship between God and humanity in some very funny ways, I also wondered about what is the role between humor and faith? And thankfully for the kids, I kept those as inside thoughts because nothing ruins a funny movie more than your pastor mother wanting to overanalyze it and ask you questions like, okay, in that scene where Steve Carell's character, who's a news anchor, is giving the news report and, and starts talking like, blah, 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 blah. like, what specifically did you find funny about that? Break it down for me. But, so I didn't do that, but I'm here now preaching that very sermon and i'm excited because we can ask those questions about laughter and humor and faith because the lord himself asks abraham and sarah about why they are laughing about what he said why do we laugh what makes something funny can we laugh at something that god says or does can we laugh with God? Let's back up. We've jumped ahead a fair amount in the story. Remember last week we were at the very beginning, at creation. And from there, Genesis tells us about the first humans making some poor choices, as humans are wont to do, and how that impacts their relationship with God and the earth and other people. And then we hear the story of the flood and the Tower of Babel. And then in chapter 12, the narrative focuses in. It goes from talking about all the people in the world to zooming in on this one family who God chooses. And God says to this couple, Abraham and Sarah, I am sending you to a new place that I will show you. I'm going to give you numerous descendants and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And they go. They have some adventures along the way, but God keeps reaffirming to Abraham and Sarah, I am making these promises. We've got a covenant here. Trust me that what I'm saying is true. But they struggle with that because what God is saying seems to fly in the face of the way these things typically work. So in the chapter right before what we read this morning, God appears to Abraham and says, hey, we've got this covenant, um, and, and Sarah, part of this is descendants, and so Sarah is going to have a baby. And do you know what Abraham does? This is in Genesis 17, verse 17. It says, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? I mean, it's funny, right? Like the idea of someone in their 90s getting pregnant, although I don't know if you're in your 90s, that might like strike terror in your heart, not humor, but like that's not what's supposed to happen, right? Like there's this incongruity here, and that perception of incongruity is so often what makes something funny, right? Like with the, the movie we were watching, like we know a news anchor is supposed to be serious. They're sharing the news, and so when someone starts talking in a voice like this, right, like it's surprising. It's not what's supposed to happen. And that incongruity between what we expect and what's in front of us there, that can make us laugh. A 90-year-old woman having a baby? Not expected, not the way it's supposed to be. 
it's funny to think about. So while Abraham has fallen on his face, rolling on the floor laughing, God says, yeah, no, Abraham, this is happening. You're going to have a son, and I want you to name him Isaac. So remember that name, Isaac, that God gives here. And Abraham says, okay. But it's clear that Abraham still thinks that his son that he had with Hagar, Ishmael, is really the one who's going to fulfill this promise. He has Ishmael circumcised. He, He puts the sign of the covenant promise on Ishmael because he thinks this is the only way descendants are going to happen for me. What God is saying is ridiculous. So that's chapter 17, right? The very next scene is what we heard just now from chapter 18. Abraham and Sarah have set up their tent in a place that has been a holy place for Abraham. He has set up an altar there by the Oaks of Mamre near Hebron. And it's a hot day. They're probably sitting there fanning themselves with something like those old, like, funeral home fans, right? There's no AC, it's hot, and all of a sudden they see these three men. Now, we know that these men are of divine origin because the narrator has already told us the Lord appeared to Abraham. But at this point, Abraham and Sarah have no real way of knowing that these three are anybody other than simply travelers who are out in the heat of the day and need a a rest stop, a place to have a little food, water, rest a bit before they continue on their way. So Abraham shows this really generous hospitality to them, and all seems well. But then things start to get a little weird, because these visitors say to Abraham, where is your wife Sarah? And Abraham surely thought, how do you know my wife's name? Why are you asking about her? But he says, um, okay, well, she's, she's there in the tent. And one of the guys says, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Now that phrase, in due season, can also be translated as like the time of life, which can also mean next spring, right? Like the time of life and birth and growth. Um, But the word play there on the time of life uh, is significant because for Sarah and Abraham, the time of, of new life has passed. That ship has long ago sailed. Sarah is way past menopause. There is incongruity here. And that's funny to Sarah. Again, our our translation hides some of the body humor that is, is in this text. Um, It's kind of PG-13, so I'll say this carefully, but when Sarah says, my husband's old, how can this be? The Hebrew used their, um, another way of phrasing it is in this pre-Viagra world, is Abraham up for the task? Okay, that's funny, right? It's unexpected. Like, we we don't come to the Bible expecting, like, the matriarchs to be joking about that kind of stuff, but they very much do. It's funny. And God says to Abraham, why is Sarah laughing? Why is this funny to her, Abraham? I think sometimes we think of that as a rebuke against Sarah, right? Like that God is somehow implying she shouldn't be laughing. But actually, I'm convinced that God is actually calling Abraham out here. Because remember, Abraham has already heard this promise. It is not new news to him. But it clearly is to Sarah. She laughs out loud. It's ridiculous. It's unexpected. So I kind of imagine God here being like, wait, Abraham, did you fail to tell your wife about this really important thing that I said was going to happen? Now, if you're married, you know how this goes, right? Like your spouse forgets to put something on the Google calendar and you're caught off guard and like, oh, this big thing's happening that really should have known about before now. And if you're the one who forgets, you probably hear about it. But here it's God calling Abraham out on it. Why is she laughing, Abraham? Didn't she know? This should not be new news to her. 
But Sarah hears the Lord say this and thinks, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm in trouble here. And so she says, no, no, I didn't laugh. And God says, yeah, you did. You did. Of course you did, Sarah. This whole thing is ridiculous. But is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Honestly, I imagine the Lord himself laughing through this whole scene. You know, I just can't see these three guys not, like, like keeping a straight face through this whole interaction. They had to have been snickering, like, ha <laughs> jokes on them. Won't they be surprised when this really does happen? And that's exactly what happens. God turns Abraham and Sarah's cynical laughter into joyful laughter when a child named laughter is born. That's what the name Isaac means. Laughter. God wanted them to have laughter in their midst. I think God wants everyone to have laughter in their midst. Sarah gets it when she says, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Frederick Buechner writes, God not only tolerated their laughter, but blessed it. And in a sense, joined in it himself. Because remember, it was God who said, name this kid laughter. And that makes it a very special laughter indeed. Buechner writes, God and man laughing together, sharing a glorious joke in which both of them are involved. I'm not sure that there's anything that God delights in more than bringing laughter to the world. Chad Bird writes, of course, God had the last laugh with Sarah and Abraham, or rather his divine laughter was infectious. All involved were cracking up, doubling over with delight at how insanely wonderful it all was. He adds, Christianity might have the reputation in some circles of being morose and ultra-serious, but it is the faith of joy, delight, and yes, laughter. The seeming impossibility of a 90-year-old conceiving was followed finally by a virgin conceiving. We shake our heads and smile in wonder. God is up to something. Like a comedian waiting to deliver the punchline, God will eventually deliver the unexpected resurrection. And all creation gasps with the happiness of irrepressible joy. God's job is to raise the dead and bring Easter joy and laughter to the whole world. Right? I mean, God's whole thing is to step into dark places in people's lives and surprise them with the good news that the darkness and the death that seems to surround us is not the final word. That's unexpected. It feels like incongruity, but it's true. You thought death was going to have the final word, Sarah, but no, here's life. Rejoice. Laugh with me. I think sometimes God knows uh, we need humor to be able to hear deep truth. Humor, laughter, it can, it can disarm us, right? And allow us to, to shift our perception, to see the world a little bit differently. Through God's humor, God is opening up this whole sphere of reality to us that otherwise we'd miss. God invites us to laugh, to laugh at the absurdity of our faith, because it really is absurd, right? Like to forgive someone seven times 70, to love others just as much, if, if not more than ourselves, to sell everything we've got and give the money to the poor. It's crazy. Who does that? And yet there's such joy in it. You just kind of have to chuckle. God calls us to laugh at ourselves because we really are ridiculous sometimes. I think God calls us to laugh at death because death thinks it's got the ultimate power, but we know that's wrong. 
Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15 when he laughs in the face of death. We don't think of Paul as being a comedian, but he laughs, he mocks death. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? And so we too can laugh even in the midst of tragedy and sadness because we do believe that God is going to be in the empty tomb, in the darkness, bringing about new life and light. That doesn't mean we, we like minimize the pain or, or, you know, I mean, we have to allow ourselves to feel that too, but it's, but it's a both and, right? And, and we feel that pain knowing that it is not the final word. I've heard laughter is a subversive witness to hope. I love that. Laughter is a subversive witness to hope. And laughing in the midst of life's pain, it, it brings hope and joy into the darkness. A colleague of mine um, had a parishioner, his name was Don, and every week when the pastor would see Don, he'd say, hey, Don, great to see you. And Don would reply, great to be seen, better than being viewed, like a funeral, yeah. So one Sunday, as usual, they had this exchange, great to see you, great to be seen, better than being viewed. And a week later, Don died. He died of cancer, which he knew he had, but he hadn't told anyone. And so that last time he saw my colleague and he said, better than being viewed, Don knew full well what was happening. He knew how soon it would be until he would be, be, be viewed. As Don literally stared death in the face, making this joke was his way of spreading hope and joy in the midst of this darkness that he was experiencing because he knew God's punchline was coming. So over these four weeks, we've sort of organized our, our worship and, and preaching around this theme of who am I? So we talked last week about how we're, we're created to be in community, created for relationship. I think this week uh, we are reminded that we are created to laugh. Who am I? I am one who laughs, who laughs at the absurdity of life and death and the absurdity of God showing up and bringing newness of life. I don't know still really why Steve Carell and Jim Carrey are funny to me. And I'm glad that I don't have to analyze it. My kids are very glad that I'm not making them analyze it. But I can give thanks that I can laugh. May we all find joy and laughter along with Sarah, along with God. May we at the outlandishness of God who does impossible things with impossible people. A God who changes the tears of Good Friday into the laughter of Easter Sunday. Amen.